Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Black History Month. Uh, kick off with the keynote speaker, Dr. Ocheka Alozi. Uh, before we continue, I would like to remind everyone to please mute uh, your mics and turn your uh, cameras off in order to avoid any background noise and not to affect the bandwidth. Uh, you will get an opportunity to ask questions um, once our moderator uh, will let you know. Uh, please know that we are recording this discussion in order to continue sharing this great event. Uh, my name is Lee Vasquez and I am the coordinator for diversity and inclusion programs. <clears throat> and currently we are um, Currently, we are under um, the direction of Dr. Andrew M. Peña. He's the Executive Director for Human Resources. And also on here is Luz de los Reyes, our Administrative Associate. Uh, I have to say that <clears throat> we are not able to do these great discussions without uh, our events, without uh, our great committees. So I would like to take a moment to say a big thank you uh, and recognize our Black History Month committee Shonique Torrance, Antonio Rodarte, Curtis Smith, Monica Tucker, and Anthony Robinson. Thank you so much for, for all your help. Um, we cannot do these events without you. Uh, so a big thank you to all of them. Uh, today's moderator is going to be Ms. Shonique Torrance. Uh, she is the type of person who wants to bring the love and passion she has for El Paso to everyone. Moving back to El Paso in 2015, she started to volunteer with the Socorro Independent School District and is currently a substitute educator there. Uh, not so uh, soon after that, she started her entrepreneurial uh, journey as a travel advisor to plan family trips and getaways for herself and others. Uh, wanting to give back to her fellow women veterans, she became a woven uh, peer leader by the offer of the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic at Endeavor, El Paso, Texas. Woven helps women uh, veterans to connect with other women to build camaraderie and sisterhood in person and online. Shonique spends her free time sharing on her daughter as she competes in her sports. She also engages in her woven with her woven sisters, conducts interviews for Black El Paso Voice, collaborates with EPCC as a member of the Black History Month Committee and is an MLK subcommittee member and is committed to staying actively involved in the community. So with that, I would like to say uh, welcome to Ms. Shanique Torrance. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lee, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I greatly appreciate you taking time out of your busy Saturday to uh, join the cause. We really like that kind of stuff, and we've got some good stuff ahead of you. As Lee said, we have Dr. Ogachika Alosi. And in front of me, I see a list of awesome, like stellar accomplishments. So I am excited to get started with this. But I have to tell you about this awesome person because he has graced us with his presence. So here we go. He is a graduate of the Un University of Minnesota's Infectious Diseases Fellowship. Prior to this, he received his medical degree from the University of Benin in Nigeria, and then completed internship and residency at the Hennepin County Medical Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Minnesota, where he got his introduction to digital health. He is also board certified in clinical informatics by the American Board of Preventative Medicine, making him one of less than 100 such certified physicians in the great big state of Texas. Dr. Dr. Losey was most recently the chief medical officer at Del Sol Medical Center where he oversaw clinical quality, physician alignment, and partnered on healthcare innovations. He is presently the CEO of Southwest Viral Medical. Gotta love technology. Of Southwest Viral Medical, a nonprofit organization in El Paso responsible for the care of clients living with HIV. Dr. Alosi believes that patient care is the most important part of medicine. Technology is not, I have to pause there, is not a replacement for patient care, but rather a way to enhance a catalyst the care our patients deserve. 
as the chair, co-chair, or member of uh, the, uh, excuse me, the multiple local and state committees, he represent El Paso, focused on how health information technology can improve care. He gave a TEDx El Paso talk titled The Digital Immigrant in 2016, and in the same year was awarded Best Doctor in the City 2016 by the El Paso City Magazine. In 2017, the El Paso Pharmacy Association gave his clinic the award for innovative practice. In 2020, Dr. Alosi represented the El Paso community to various media channels during the COVID pandemic. These included CNBC, Bloomberg, NPR, and CBS. He is presently a medical contributor for El Paso TV station KVIA. And thank you so much for being here for us today. Welcome, bienvenido, Dr. Alosi. You have the floor, yeah, sir. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, happy thank Saturday, you. everybody. Good morning. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy days to have this quick talk. And so <clears throat> I'm going to dive right in. I appreciate the <laughs> amazing introduction. So give me a second. Let me get to this. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Where'd it go? There we go. It's always fun. Like you said, when technology doesn't do what you want it to do. Uh oh. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. All right, so I'll dive right in. So really, I mean, in honor of Black History Month, I think it is important. I mean, obviously, the space that I live in is healthcare, being a practicing physician and having treated patients with a host of infectious disease issues over the last few decades, really. Um, that's sort of what I think about day in and day out. Also, having been a sort of leader or administrator, both at Texas Tech and at a HCA facility, Del Sol Medical Center, has given me sort of context to look at that through that lens. And so really want to talk about what exists out there. And so part of it is, like Jay-Z said, right, allow me to reintroduce myself. I mean, this is what a lot of people see. And the period of COVID has been interesting. So a lot of interviews, a lot of talking, probably why my voice is a little bit off right now. But that's not the whole story. And so a lot of people don't realize that I was actually um, born in Nigeria. If this works, please work. Oh, it doesn't want to work. I love it when technology hates me. Oh, we're going to try this one more time. Nope, it did not. Well, I'll leave this map up here and I'll talk through it. It's supposed to be moving, but I was born in um, Nigeria and that's where my family's originally from. I went from there to Minnesota where I grew up as a kid. So I was about a junior in high school, went back to Nigeria and then finally returned to the States and have been living in El Paso for 12 years. If we want to talk about disparity in healthcare, I think it's sort of important to sort of define it, right? And so it sort of refers to the imbalances and incongruities between the treatment of racial groups, which are based on a host of things, right? A lot of times we just talk about the color of one's skin, but it's not just that, right? That drives a host of imbalances, whether it's economic imbalances, housing options, how society treats you, safety, and a host of other things. And it has, it's remarkable that in multiple study after study, irrespective of where people go to medical school, what kind of training they have, what specialty they have, that there does seem to be some implicit bias in terms of the positive attitude towards white patients versus the negative attitudes towards patients of color. And so when we try to change this, it has to be interventions that are targeting the attitudes because we have the access to care, right? If you get into a hospital, obviously that's dependent on your insurance status, but if you get into a hospital, you will get on average good care. And so some of, what are some of these sort of um, objective disparities that we talk about in healthcare. And you can see right here, the mortality rate across racial and ethnic groups, right? So you can see that unfortunately, if you are a female, black in America, you have a higher rate of death when having a child. And that I means it's really unspeakable. And you can see all across all the other ethnic groups and racial breakdowns. And the gap is, I mean, it's tremendous in the African-American community. And that is something that's been called um, to the to be multiple times. I mean, even Serena Williams talked about it when she had her daughter some years ago. 
And part of it is not just that, but how these racial disparities change, right? So one thing is we know they exist. And not to be Debbie Downer, right? I think we also have to talk about the improvements. And I really want to look at the cancer mortality. You can see a dramatic drop over the last 20 years in cancer mortality, and yet that disparity still exists, right? And so there are a host of authors that have talked about the implicit bias of just skin color. There's the access to care. Where do you live? What kind of hospital is where you live? What kind of doctors are where you live? But all of these things join together to continually create this persistent disparity that we have. And it's not just the individual things, right? Whether it's um, perinatal mortality, cancer incidence, it's also how long do you live? And so based on this, I think <laughs> I was, somebody was joking with me the other day, I think I'm about to be 50, so I only have like 20 years left, 22 more years left. But again, it, it's, a mixed, it's a mixed bag, right? That double-edged sword, there is clearly a disparity in terms of life expectancy, but it's gotten better over the last 30 years. And so in as much as we should celebrate the improvements, there is still work to be done. And I think that's clearly um, very, very important. So what are these solutions? And I don't think there's ever one solution, but I do think that there's been a conversation in the sort of Tamir Rice, George Floyd, uh, Ahmed Aubrey world that we sort of have lived in through COVID to talk about inclusion and being at the table. And I say this all the time, I used to say it at HCA all the time, you can't have a conversation about us without us, right? And so you can see the current demographics of active physicians by race and ethnicity across the country, right? And so obviously, um, Caucasians 56.2%, Asian 17.1%, um, unknown is always interesting, and then Black is about 5%, right? So 64% of all physicians are male, which is problematic, especially if you're a female, and especially if you're in the OBGYN space, and then 56% 56 are, 56 are Caucasian. You can then see that only 6% of physicians identify as Hispanic, despite this group making up 19% of the population, similar disparities in terms of African-American, only 5%. You may say, well, okay, well, that's great. What about locally? And it is interesting that the disparity is almost in reverse, and that it makes El Paso a very unique place to live, right? So again, underrepresented actually, and that you would probably think that's a surprise, but underrepresented in terms of the physicians. And I'll walk you through this. On the left is the population of El Paso. On the right is the makeup of the physicians. And you can see, even though the population is about 80% per 2019 data, physicians are only about 26%. You can see Caucasian is overrepresented, 12% in population, 47% in physicians. And what's interesting is that El Paso is actually one of the few large metros above half a million where African-American physicians actually overrepresent the percentage of the population. It may not feel like that depending on where you live, east side, west side, northeast, um, but the numbers bear that out. And so I think that's just sort of um, something to think about. And so what are the advantages of representation, right? Why do we care? Why should it matter that the doctor looks like you? I think one thing is just increased comfort levels. We all know that when we walk into some place where we either know somebody, that people look like us, we have that endorphin sort of reduction, right? It's not that fight or flight phenomenon, rather it's a sense of comfort, right? And it really leads to more innovation and boost creativity. Those things go together. When you feel a part of that medical community, you are willing to work through problems with your healthcare provider. There's a better understanding of where you've come from. Trust, and even in the VA system, that's probably the system that we look to the most when we're trying to sort of account for all um, things like financial and insurance and the rest, there's a lot of conversation about increased trust. Just the fact that your doctor looks like you, patients seem to trust the clinician better. And higher retention, communication, reduced disparities, and increased engagement. I think all of those are critically important. And then the real question becomes, well, how do we start to engender that in our community locally here in El Paso? And it's never easy, right? But I think the simple answers are really easy, right? And a lot of times they're wrong. 
right? To get to something that is holistic, mechanistic, engaging, and really in elevates your community, it usually is complex. It usually is hard, um, but that's the direct you want to go. And I think this sort of conversation can hopefully help people, even if it's just for a minute, think about, well, what can I do in my community? What can I do at EPCC to change the tenor of how we look at education and the pathways away from education? Not necessarily away from going to education, but after you get that education, what do you use that education to do? And so I think that is really sort of the crux of this conversation. And so with that, I will, I promised I would make it brief just to sort of jog a few thoughts and we can sort of circle back and open it up for questions. Oh, did everybody run away? <laughs> no, definitely here, president accounted for, just taking in all the good stuff. Oh my goodness. When I tell you, Dr. Losey, we've had a like a flood of questions, not necessarily about the entire thing that you talked about, but it's pertaining the theme, uh, black and black health and wellness in the black community uh, or in the black community. So I'll start off with a couple questions and you just Feel comfortable as you appear and we'll go from there. That's all right. Let's do it. That's all true. right, let's do it. I like that. Okay. So the first question is, how can someone on a fixed income improve their nutrition and their exercise program if they have like bad knees or things of that nature? Yeah, I think that's always difficult, right? Um, I will say this, and you sort of added a little asterisk to that with the knees part. I think that if you do have bad knees, we each have to sort of figure out what are the things that we can do within our space not to aggravate that. Is it a walk around your neighborhood, right? And if you say, well, my, my knees are so bad that I can't walk, are you able to be mobile within the house, right? People miss, so there's this misconception that to get fit, you must leave the home, right? There are things that you can do in the home, whether it's uh, for the wall sits or walking around the limited space that you have, but just keeping active is better than being inactive. And even if that activity is 500 steps a day, 5,000 steps a day, 50,000 steps a day. Any of those is better than nothing. So I think that's the key. The other piece, and this is really something that there's no good answer for, right? How do you create a nutritious diet on a fixed income, understanding that not just in El Paso, but in most metropolitan and urban areas, we have food deserts, right? We do not value healthy food in this country, unfortunately, as much food as we have and as much as we throw away. And so that really becomes problematic. I mean, I think that is something where our elected leaders, we really have to push our elected leaders. It's not just about building new 12 lane highways and putting a cover over an existing highway. So it looks pretty and it has a space that nobody's really going to use. It's about, hey, what about our existing neighborhoods? How do we elevate and scale those neighborhoods to allow them to have affordable food? to not have to go all the time to a Burger King or McDonald's or a Chick-fil-A or whatever it may be to get their nutrition, right? How do we engender farmers markets in those neighborhoods? And those are political decisions, right? Those are political answers. Those can't be done on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And so I think one thing that I often tell people, and a lot of times they don't um, sort of, we always misunderstand or don't truly understand the power of politics, right? Because essentially what we see is the left-right divide, the Fox News versus MSNBC divide. And that's great, but like buying a house, everything is location, location. Those things don't necessarily affect us locally. Get involved in local politics because I do think we have to hold our politicians to bear they have to be held accountable if they've been in office and they haven't changed our locality. They haven't changed your neighborhood. And those are things that we need to talk about, not just highways and a host of other things. You are so right, because I am I, I try to navigate the waters of politics, but ooh, it takes an art. But here's the next question. Actually, it's two. Um, one is, what are some of the reasons a person would be predisposed in developing health issues? And then how often should individuals see their doctor? Yeah, so the whole nature versus nurture conversation. I think there are some things that we inherit. I mean, obviously, we inherit a predisposition to be a certain height, a certain weight. We can obviously work through some of those things younger, 
But the older you get, the harder it becomes, right? And so nature or your environmental factors, where do you live? Do you have to walk to get a train or a bus? Do you drive everywhere? Are there walkable pathways or bikeable pathways in your neighborhood? If you've never grown up with any of those things, and then one day you wake up at 50, it's going to be really hard to suddenly change, right? And obviously, we always see those um, social media posts of the one person out of 100,000 that did it. But that's why it's that one person. It's not a systemic change. And so I think one of the things that we need to do better as well, and again, this comes into education, whether it's EPCC or independent school districts, is how do we get the kids to realize that uh, part of education is health, right? It's not just math and reading and writing and a host of other things, all critically important to grow into good adults, but it's also being healthy. Right. The childhood obesity and diabetic rate in this country and this community is skyrocketing. Right. And how do we fix that? It's not. And a lot of times people say, well, it's just the culture. Well, yeah, that doesn't make sense because originally that culture, whether it was African-American or Hispanic, led to much healthier people. Right. And so we have ways that we can change that. I think that's part one of the question in terms of how long you should see a physician. I mean, I think that's a conversation between your physician and you. I would say on average, it should be twice a year. Right? You really want to get in to see that person twice a year. But I've also said when people say, well, sort of pivot to COVID for a second. Well, who should get a COVID booster? I say, if you see a doctor two times a year or more, you're not necessarily healthy and you need to get a booster. Right. So I think at the very least, you should have these conversations with your clinicians and your healthcare community, then they can direct you whether it's twice a year, once a year, four times a year, or more, depending on your health conditions. Great answers, definitely. And with you mentioning diabetes, here are two. Uh, someone wants to know if you can explain how diabetes is a disease, and then how long can a person take medication for diabetes, not change bad eating habits and begin to see consequences? Yeah, so great questions. I think in terms of what diabetes is and how is it a disease, it's essentially an inability of your body to handle sugar. And so there we have an organ in our abdomen called the pancreas. It releases a um, chemical, chemical called insulin and insulin is what breaks down your sugar. When you don't have enough insulin, either because you were born without the ability to create it, what's called type 1, um, what we now also call adult onset or type 2 diabetes, you developed that inability to deal with it, your blood sugar gets high. And you may say, well, why do I care if my blood sugar gets high? In the olden days, they would pee, right? And if um, ants came around, they'd be like, oh my, I got sugar diabetes. And essentially the same thing. But think about it like this. The same way ants go around your urine, when we used to do that as a test, is the same way that a lot of bad things go around your body when you have too much sugar. You don't get enough oxygen in your blood. Your blood vessels get thicker. And because they get thicker, it affects your eyes. It affects your heart. It affects your kidneys. It affects your fingers and your toes. If you get an infection, think about having an infection and pouring sugar into that infection and seeing if it'll heal obviously it won't heal. And not only will it not heal, it can actually get more and more infected. And so a lot of, sometimes a lot of what I do in the hospital is dealing with patients that have the consequences of uncontrolled diabetes and the fact that they now have to have a toe removed or an ankle removed or somebody, unfortunately, this week that had their whole leg removed. If the question is, how long can you go without treating it before you see the consequences, that's all variable. Everybody, every individual is an individual. We all have our own story and it's not just our life story, but our healthcare story. I've seen people have diabetes 10 years and not have any consequences. I've seen people have diabetes 10 weeks and be dead in the hospital because of a sudden and overwhelming infection that affected them because of their diabetes. If you're pre-diabetic, if you're diabetic, critically important that you have a relationship with your primary care physician or endocrinologist. You need to be checking your sugars and you need to be taking your medication. But at the end of the day, again, this comes back to sort of that early onset education, right? If we can get kids not to be obese, we can reduce diabetes. Because the number one driver um, for diabetes is weight. And so the heavier you are, the more risk you have of being diabetic. And I think that is a critical key that we need to push to people. Thank you so much. Uh, we also have a, um, it's Oscar Gonzalez. 
he has a question more dealing with local since you said you reside right since you've been residing here for 12 years. Um, are there diseases in El Paso that are more prevalent among Hispanics and blacks compared to whites, i.e. breast cancer, hypertension, etc.? Do you feel there are disparities in treatment that lead to these outcomes? Well, I mean, so the short answer is yes. There's a host of the diseases and he, he outlined them whether it's heart disease, whether it's diabetes, whether it's cancer. But I think, again, we need to realize that a huge driver of all of those things is weight, right? It's estimated that if we were able to reduce the average person's weight by 10 pounds, we would cut a lot of those diseases in half. And so obesity drives majority of those things, whether it's diabetes, whether it's hypertension. The larger you are, the more risk you have for cancer. Obviously, smoking and alcohol play into that as well. So there's one thing I would say that we need to work on in our communities. It would be weight. How do we eat? How do we exercise? Those are the main two things. And then in terms of treatment outcomes, absolutely. I mean, so, so some of the stuff that we outlined earlier, are they getting better? Yes, they are getting better. Is there still a disparity? Absolutely, there's still a disparity. And this is where we sort of talk about, it's not an individual level disparity, it's, system, it's systemic and systematic, right? Because when you look at the disparity or the gaps in terms of what do the patients look like and what do the physicians look like, right? Um, again, can't have a conversation about us without us. We as a community and across the country, the American Medical Association, I'm on one of their boards around equity in admissions and getting more um, children of color into the healthcare space, that's something that's an active topic for them, right? Um, but again, the treatments are the treatments. And it's one of those things I always used to laugh as a resident up in Minnesota. We do this thing in healthcare where we say uh, 32 year old Hispanic female or a 42 year old African American male. And I would always say, why does it matter what their race is? Unless there's a treatment that you're telling me that is specific to Hispanics or specific to African Americans, they're a 32 year old female. And that's the, and it's things like that that seem incidental and seem inconsequential, but as we all know, language matters. When you're calling out the race every time, you're creating a system where, oh God, okay, black dude came in or Hispanic lady came in and you're creating that bias through the education. And so worked to remove some of that language up in Minnesota. What was interesting to me when I moved to El Paso, everybody was doing it here too. And so I've been working with some of the graduate medical education programs to think through that. But again, how we approach a patient from the jump is very critical in how we treat them throughout that stay or throughout their healthcare journey. And so I think those are important things to think about as well. Great breakdown, and I really painted a clear picture, so I hope everyone was able to see it clearly. Um, these next three are specific uh, detailed, um, well, examples, I guess you can say. The first one says, a person is experiencing buzzing, water gushing sounds in their ears. What could this be? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> shouldn't, <laughs> I always say, I, I, play, I only play a doctor on TV, right? So, um, although I did say the Holiday Inn Express last night, but I try, I try not to create a, a diagnostic forum, but I mean, that sounds like tinnitus. Sounds like the person could have an ear infection. They need to go see their doctor. I mean, I think that's really the long and short of it. Got you. Well, there's two more, and I just want to make sure. Are you comfortable with them, or are you? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, throw them out. I'll, I'll, I'll punt them if I need to punt, but throw them out. All right, let me throw that dice. Here we go. <laughs> person is experiencing eye twitching, which leads to eyelids shutting down. Person has to hold eyelids open with fingers. This happens different times of the day. What could this be related to? Yeah, that could be a vitamin deficiency. Um, it could be palpebral syndrome. There's a host of things around that. It could be, again, um, got to go see your physician and potentially go see an eye doctor. Got it. And here's the last one. Uh, patient had Bell's palsy for about a year and a half or about a year and a half ago. The right side of the face is still not working properly and still sags from time to time. What can be done to resolve this? 
I mean, in reality, there's very little that can be done. That's unfortunately one of those post bell palsy um, syndromes or um, symptoms that just exist, and it's unfortunate. There's not a lot that can be done. I mean, physical therapy is important. Again, I think getting with a neurologist to reevaluate you, possibly do some facial physical therapy will be important. But a year and a half later, um, most likely outside the window of being able to fix that. Got it, got it. Hope everyone's taking notes because this is some good stuff and you did take the time to write down these specific examples and questions. So here we go with the next one. Should we be concerned with adverse side effects when combined with supplements? That's a hard one because it's really general. I mean, you always want to worry about or think through the adverse events of any medication that you're putting in your body and really determine what's the benefit versus the risk. Um, I think for most people, they don't require supplements. And so my recommendation would be if you don't need the supplement, don't take it. If you're having adverse side effects of any medication or supplement, you really got to stop it and then have a conversation with your physician about what to do next. Got it. Well, what options exist that can be used when doing a contrast CT scan for a person who has allergies to iodine? These are really I interesting questions. Chuckling. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a host of different options that we use in the hospital for that. And so I think, again, that's one of those questions where if you have those allergies, there's a host of different contrast media that are not allergenic or less allergenic, or you can be medicated with Benadryl and steroids. But again, those are all conversations to have with the physician that ordered it um, so they can do an alternative process. Okay, awesome. This next one, um, can you tell us about the pills offered to consumers that promise to improve memory? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, in reality, none of them work. I mean, it's great that we have this, oh, I could go off on a different rant. We have this un, um, unapproved, unlooked at space in healthcare, which is the supplement space, where essentially all you need to do to give somebody or to sell somebody a supplement is prove that it won't kill them, right? So if it doesn't make them sick, you can package it, put it in the bottle. And with great marketing, um, a lot of people will take it. So I'm not a big fan of any of those things. I think the biggest thing to exercise your mind is to use it, right? Whether it's word games, whether it's reading, exercise on its own, right? There's a lot of data that actually shows that the more you exercise, the younger your brain becomes and the more pliable your brain becomes. But brain tools and tasks and just reading are critically important to keep your brain and your memory sharp. Good answer. And it kind of goes along with what you the saying on your shirt, endure, evolve, emerge. Let's do it. Absolutely. That's why I wore this, <laughs> that's why I wore this sweatshirt today. Awesome. Awesome. I have a question from Kara. Um, it says, I hear the message about weight being our biggest issue, but I am overweight and I eat less than 1200 calories a day. I don't have diabetes. I take blood pressure medication. I walk every day. How can I articulate to my doctor that I believe I need different, <clears throat> excuse me, different lab work to see why I have changed blood pressure meds, but now my doctor prescribes diabetes medication to help with weight. What do I need to do? You might need to find another doctor that listens to you, right? I think that is, <laughs> when I hear this, it's a great message, but when I hear this, I realize, or it kind of goes back to the initial conversation I had, which is you just need to find, it's just like any relationship, right? You can go on a date and it can be a great date and you'll have another one. You can go on a date your doctor's visit, and it's not suiting your needs, and you need to go find a different clinician or physician that will listen to you. I think sometimes we get sort of stuck in feeling, well, this is my doctor. It's the only doctor that I can see. There's, it's more than fine to get a second opinion. And so I think there are hormones, whether it's cortisol or thyroid or a host of things that are involved with weight, right? You are 100% right. It's not just intake versus output. Um, there are sometimes some asterisks on the side. And if your doctor isn't um, listening to you, then maybe you need to find another physician. Got it, got it. So the next one is, um, what would be considered good probiotic and do we need to consume them? 
I will. That's one of those, um, like that email per my last email, <laughs> per my last answer of I'm not a big supplement person. So I don't, I don't regularly recommend probiotics or supplements. I think if you take them, you take them. If you find a benefit, great. If you don't, stop them. Got it. Loud and clear. Got it. <laughs> Is there such a thing as a healthy fast food? I think those are, <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for? Antithetical to each other. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sure there are, again, I'm sort of being flippant, but on average, fast food is not healthy. Uh, I think some of the fast food places are now beginning to put together an array of what they call healthy foods. But I think it's important for you to look that some of the salads that Wendy's or McDonald's or Burger King give people, lunchtime salads, are over 1,500 calories. That is at least half to 70% of your daily caloric intake. And so again, um, because they're packaging it as healthy doesn't mean it's actually healthy. And this goes back to that education piece. And whether we do it at the elementary school level, the middle school, the high school, or the college level, right? We need to teach people how to read labels. It, it is sometimes crazy. And I, and I suffer from the same thing, being a fat kid that loves cake all my life. Um, of not learning how to read labels on time, right? And thinking that I could have the bag of popcorn because it's a bag, not realizing that, that there's a 600 on the back of that, that 600 calories. And if that's your snack, you've already taken at least a quarter of your calories for the day in a snack. So again, I think part of it is, it sounds like a broken record, but we do need to learn how to make healthier choices early. It, it really is hard. I mean, I'm turned 50 this year and it, it becomes critically hard to do that the older you get. And so again, this is where maybe EPCC comes up with an early childhood education program to get into elementary schools because that's really where kids need to know because by the time they're in elementary school, they already know who Ronald McDonald and Burger King and Chick-fil-A are deliberately, right? Because of the ads that are on TV. By the time that happens, it's almost a wrap. So again, um, anything that we can do to enable kids to be health conscious earlier, I think is better for all of us. Okay, and then I have these two and then I'll go on to the, the third one. Um, does having gut issues, because you had mentioned some of this, but maybe they're asking for more clarity, but does having gut issues affect overall body health? And here's the other one. What helps better with weight loss, aerobics or lifting weights? Oh, great question. So I'll answer the first one. Yeah, there's a, there's a concept called the biome, and we have a microbiome, which is what lives in our body, the bacteria and various organisms that live there. And there are there does seem to be data that shows that there's a healthy biome and an unhealthy biome. And so people with unhealthy biome can get cardiovascular disease, can be overweight, tend to overweight. And so there are now ways to start to look at that. Again, it's a conversation to have between your physician and yourself. Um, I think the other part of it is the aerobic versus the lifting. I think the key is this, you, you gotta do something. And whether you switch it up, whether you only do one, the reality is if you do one consistently, you will lose weight as long as you're not ingesting four or 5,000 calories a day. And I think that's the key. The hard part, and I will be the first to admit it's incredibly hard, is number one, being consistent, and number two, your intake. And so um, those are really the things. And so it doesn't really matter whether it's lifting or whether it's aerobic. I think everybody should do some sort of aerobic activity because at the end of the day, those big muscles aren't going to help you if you have a weak heart, right? And so aerobic does help. And then on top of that, um, core strength and lifting just make you stronger. Very good points. Yes, consistency and intake. So here's the here's the next one, uh, and this is from um, uh, Dr. Pena. What are you hearing about the BA2 Omicron variant that may be on the horizon? Is it similar to what we experience with the Omicron? Yeah, great question. So BA2 has been a variant, a sub-variant of the Omicron class that sort of existed for a while. We're seeing it in South Africa more than anywhere else. It is in 48 states in the United States, and my estimate is that it's in every state in the United States. But apart from sort of the, some of the fear porn that you'll hear on TV and in the press, 
I think South Africa is a really good place to look. What we've seen is that BA2 is now 100% of all the samples in South Africa, but they haven't have a re had a resurgence, right? Because it is Omicron, let's call it Omicron-like, it is not causing a new surge, but instead of them coming right back down, they've sort of tapered off, right? Again, I think it's also important not necessarily to get caught up on variant by variant because there are now hundreds of variants and we don't hear about all of them until they have some sort of effect. Let's talk about what the answers are and what the solutions are, whether you have gotten vaccinated, whether you've had COVID, that provides some level of immunity. I think in our community, especially if you've gotten vaccinated, had COVID, got an extra shot, we've built up a lot of immunity. What we really need to be looking at are who are those members of our community that still can't get vaccinated or haven't been vaccinated. And I know a lot of times we talk about the unvaccinated or anti-vax, and that's part of it. But what we really need to consistently do going into the spring and summer that I think would be great from a COVID standpoint are getting to those nursing homes. We need to hunt and seek the 65-year-olds and above with multiple medical conditions who have either not been vaccinated or not been boosted. That's the majority of deaths and hospitalizations that we see in our community. Well over 80% of the people that died from COVID were above the age of 85 with a medical comorbidity. And we have to go find those. And so to me, it's a travesty that we spend all this energy trying to figure out how to vaccinate eight-year-olds and 12-year-olds when we have at least um, 10 to 15 percent of our above 65 population that hasn't been boosted. I'm glad that you brought up that population because a question came in, are there any definitive factors that causes or triggers dementia or memory loss? I mean, age. Age is the biggest thing. I mean, getting old sucks, and I'm beginning to realize that as I turn 50 this year. But, um, I mean, <laughs> age is the number one thing. And now there are other conditions, right? Um, diabetes can cause some microvasculature changes in the brain. Hypertension can do that. Kidney disease can do that. Um, smoking, alcohol can do that. But at the end of the day, it does seem as if, I mean, not does seem, age is number one. But the biggest way to combat that potentially, and there's some studies that have come out in the last couple of years, is using your brain, right? Whether it's Rubik's Cube or word games or crossword puzzles or reading, things that challenge your mind consistently are the best ways to avoid um, cognitive decline. Oh, that's really good. Here's another question. Are you seeing an active effort to reduce racial disparities in access to healthcare in El Paso? And are there any specific steps that you recommend? I think the short answer to the first one is no, but I think maybe it's a no with an asterisk. After all, we're having this conversation here. Um, it has not been something that has been on the County Medical Society's radar or docket, especially over the last two years, but that's because we've been mired in COVID, right? It's really hard to think about all these other things where you're, when everybody's terrified and losing their minds over SARS-CoV-2. I think when I sort of look at El Paso, and again, remember I pulled up that graph that showed our population versus um, the physician makeup. Could we do better in some spaces? Perhaps. Um, I think the global issue with El Paso is just recruiting, right? El Paso is sort of that hidden gem, but because it's a hidden gem, nobody's looking and very few people are talking positively about it. And so I think it's a collaborative effort, whether it's between the Hispanic Chamber, the El Paso Chamber, UTEP, Texas Tech, EPCC, whomever, the Hospitals of Providence, um, whoever is bringing clinicians and individuals into the community, uh, we have to find a way to engage with them, right? And sometimes it may not be um, a recruiting effort to specifically bring in African-American or Hispanic physicians, but at the very least, bring in people who are open-minded and hopefully are not prejudicial or have implicit bias. We have to have these conversations and they make people uncomfortable but I think it's that discomfort that sometimes, not everybody, but on the margins, will start to change things. We've seen the mortality come down. We've seen life expectancy go up, but there's still a gap, right? And by having these conversations consistently and systematically, I think we can make changes. 
I would definitely agree with you 100%. That makes so much sense. Is there a local organization or is there a possibility that an organization can be established in El Paso specifically to address African American health care, racial disparities, and healthy living concerns? Do you think it's necessary? Well, I, I don't think there's an organization that exists. Um, I think that the person that asked the question, since you're already thinking like that, I think that is something that you should definitely pursue. And I will tell you this, if you start it, you'll get a lot of help. There's be a lot of people that will um, weigh in or jump on. I mean, there's a host of people on this call or that help organize this call that are doing amazing things in the community, right? And individually, they're bringing attention to health care disparities and health and wellness. And so um, there, you may ask the question, do we need that organization? I don't know. It's hard for me to tell. And sometimes I get blinded by what I'm doing, right? I have that kind of tunnel vision of focusing on the hospital and HIV and hepatitis C and so the spaces that I live in and excel in. But I think anything that leads to that conversation is a good thing. I definitely agree. What can boost a person's immune system? And what is the status of antibiotics and how effective they are? Mm, great question. I love this. So what can boost your immune system? Uh, exercise, eating right, and rest in that, in that order, right? Those are the things that will keep you the healthiest. On top of that, depending if you have an immune deficiency, there are medications, injections, infusions that we give to people that have immune deficiency. But the average person that doesn't have a clinical or critically ill condition, it's, it's rest. It's rest, it's exercise and eating properly. Those are the three things more than anything else. Um, what was the second half of that question? Uh, the second half of that question is, what can boost a person's immune system? Oh, no, there was the antibiotics. Sorry. You, you oh, sorry. Me, what me, is me. the yeah, status? Yeah, no, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talked about the what can boost. I mean, antibiotics are great medications. They probably saved millions of lives um, from when they were discovered in the late 1800s to the early 1900s. There's a host of things that we take for granted along with immunizations and how they worked um, that have saved countless lives. The unfortunate thing is that no offense to Tom, Dick, or Harry, but every Tom, Dick, and Harry gets an antibiotic, right? I know friends that go across the street to Juarez to get an antibiotic because they think you can fix them. Um, and it's, it's mistaken. But again, it is what it is. I think, however, that one thing people need to realize, and we don't talk about this enough, and I understand why, because if you're in an urgent care and emergency room and you're seeing four or 500 patients a day, you don't have the time to talk to them about, hey, this is viral. Giving you an antibiotic doesn't help a virus and people don't really care. They just want a thing to help them get better. But if we're having an honest conversation about antibiotics and what they do, I'd say 70 to 80 percent of the times that somebody is giving an antibiotic, it's an inappropriate antibiotic and it's doing nothing for them except creating a placebo effect. Got you. So going on to this one, why is it so difficult to identify the best medication for an individual with a high blood pressure and then will there ever be a time when drug manufacturers will not be able to offer drugs directly to the public i'll answer the second question and my guess is no um that they will always be able to do that because we live in america and for better or for worse that's just how we're wired um i think yeah, that's a hard one. What was the first part of the question? Uh, will there ever be, oh, why is it uh, so difficult to identify the best medication? For uh, an yes, the hypertension I piece. Yeah, I mean, every, everybody, everybody responds differently to a medication, right? And so there's guidance around what you should give. There's a host of different classes of antihypertensives, but everybody responds differently. And so I think that's fair. It's a good thing that not everybody responds the same. And it's also a good thing that there's a host of different antihypertensive medications. And so that relationship or that process of discovering what's best for you with your physician is, I mean, that's the key part of medicine. Medicine is an art and a science. And some of that art is the trial and error of identifying which medication works best for which individual. Okay, thank you. And then a lot of people have said that there's a, a, a like a, a, a big powerful thing in regards to walking in regards to health. Does walking actually contribute to health and well-being? 
Absolutely, 100%. I mean, not everybody can run, um, but most people, not everybody, I understand, but most people can walk. And so you don't have to go do a half marathon or a 5K or a 3K. Walk a mile. Walk a mile consistently. Walk a mile every day. If you do that, you will start to re believe, re realize rather that mile is not very long. You might stretch it. And one thing I tell people, hey, if all you want to do is do the mile and that's what's comfortable for you, then walk the mile, right? But then over time, speed the mile up. So maybe it's 20 minutes initially, then it goes to 15, then it goes to 10. You're still getting that exercise, but you're pushing yourself. And so not everything has to be in the gym. Not everything has to be a 5K or running 10 miles every morning. Some people can do that. Some people can't. But if you're consistent with your um, engagement, it can work. And I, and again, I get it. I've lived this personally where I've done great for years and then I failed completely for years. And it mm -hmm. goes back and forth. And so, I mean, that's life. That's the journey of life. And so right. it is what it is. So progress by moving forward, basically, right? Um, I have two more, and then I know we are at 11.52, doing great. This has been some great momentum. Let's finish these off. The next one is, how effective are medical appointments over the phone or computer? Ah, oh, telehealth. So you're talking it's to a, a biased, yeah. <laughs> you're talking to a biased source because I am the Texas Medical Association chairperson for the Health Information Technology Committee. And so that's kind of my jam, right? That's what I started to create at Texas Tech before I left. It's what I've been a big advocate for. It's sort of what I was talking about when I did my TED Talk in 2016 about the digital immigrant, which is healthcare is evolving and technology is evolving. We need to evolve healthcare to allow people, the patient, also be a consumer to ingest healthcare in a way that's convenient to them. It doesn't make sense to drive multiple hours or minutes to sit in a waiting room for two hours to fill out all this paperwork in paper, when in every other facet of our life, we get on our phone, be it iPhone or Android, and I can get on Amazon, I can get to my bank, I can order Uber Eats, um, whatever the case may be, right? You can do all those things. and so. Is healthcare that? No, it's not necessarily a consumer ingestion industry, but there are ways that we can make the engagement in healthcare a lot more, a lot more seamless, more seamless, yes, and more engaged for people, especially younger people who don't necessarily want to be in a, pay, a physician's office all the time. Now, if you have, um, if you've broken something, if you have chest pain, if you have to have surgery, that's not what telemedicine is for. But telemedicine can do really easy triage on somebody that's sick or follow-up visits for somebody that's stable. And I think you'll start to see a lot more pivot in this community um, as various clinicians get older and retire. The younger ones come up and they're driving how the mechanistics of healthcare run. But I think that is something that will change over time. Got it. Wonderful. And last but not least, uh, how can folks best serve as allies in supporting black health and wellness? Hmm. That's a great question. I think the first thing is um, you got to support yourself first, right? You got to get yourself right, which is how are you engaging in that conversation? In, in terms of how do you grow it from there? Again, I think it's all about conversation, right? If Is there a thing like if you gave me a magic wand, is there a thing that I would say we need to do X to change um, the racial disparities around healthcare in El Paso? Again, for me, it's education and health, right? Early diet and activity education for kids. I think that's critically important. But at the end of the day, I think having an open mind, being open to these conversations and engaging in these conversations, those are the keys. And if we can do those, even if we do that 10% of the time, forget the 90%, even if everybody starts to do that 5, 10% of the time, that mass effect will create great change. I definitely agree. Well, I tell you what, this has been a phenomenal opportunity. You have done a stellar performance <laughs> with all of your wisdom. Thank you so much for sharing. At this time, I will turn it over into the hands of the great El Paso Community College, Lee Vasquez. Thank you again for the opportunity. Yes, thank you once again, uh, Shonik and Dr. Alosi for, for being here with us today. Uh, I think there were great uh, questions and great answers on there. 
So thank you for being with us today. Uh, I do want to mention some stuff uh, before we leave on here. Um, let me just bring it up real quick, our PowerPoint. All right. Uh, so we're going to continue the conversation uh, this week. So everyone is welcome to join us on February 22nd, which is on Tuesday from noon to one. We're going to have another discussion panel with our nutrition and wellness uh, panel. Uh, they're going to talk a little bit more about that. And then on the 24th from 4 to 5 p.m., we're going to have a mental health and testing discussion panel. So our panelists are ready to answer your questions also. So feel free to send us those questions over. Chonique did a great job today and she will be the moderator for those too. So we look forward to that. Uh, please, if you want to RSVP and receive the direct link or a calendar invite, go to our epcc.edu slash services slash diversity webpage and you could do it there. If not on the day of the, of the event, you could just go to the link there or on our social media. Uh, I do want to mention uh, and spread the word that uh, we are going to be offering a Black History Month scholarship. Uh, everything should be up hopefully by Monday and our um, financial aid webpage. Uh, so spread the news. Uh, the application is going to be starting from Monday all the way to March the 31st. And those are kind of like the requirements. We're going to be giving out $1,000 for full-time attendance and $500 for part-time. Um, so we have some of those. Uh, we want to kind of um, help a little bit uh, with the African-American, uh, I guess, um, descent. Kind of like uh, raise it up a little bit with uh, El Paso Community College. So. This is a scholarship that we're going to be offering and make sure to give out that information. Um, also, and right now, in the if you'll go to the chat box, uh, we should have the link. We're continuing our Black History Month through art and conversation. Uh, thank you to Carla Zanelli from the El Paso Art Association, EPAA. Uh, she did interviews with some local artists. Uh, so, uh, the first video that we have is going to be from Alice Ada Ayers and later on in the week we're going to have one from Michael uh, Novotny. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, this will be on YouTube so you could go at any time and view that uh, uh, conversation. It's very good uh, and once again it's celebrating Black History Month through art and conversation. Uh, and feel free to also contact the Diversity Inclusion Web uh, uh, team, Dr. Peña, there's this information, Luz Reyes, Administrator Associate, or myself, uh, give us a call, or if you have any questions or anything, feel free to do that. Uh, we are going to be also putting on our chat um, a survey. Let us know how we did, what other type of conversation or guest speakers you would like for us to, to um, invite. So make sure that fill out that uh, survey let us know uh, that information. This is how we can improve. Also feel free to contact us if you have any uh, suggestions. Uh, once again, we are on social media, uh, Instagram and Facebook. So visit us there. Uh, that's where we put all our events, the direct links to any of these events. So make sure to visit us and like. And for future, uh, workshops, visit us at our diversity webpage. So with that being said, thank you once again, everybody, for being here. Dr. Alosi, thank you once again for being here this Saturday. So, thank, you. thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll see you all. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>